<laughs> Welcome Zoom attendees. <laughs> We're just in the middle of the introduction as to what this panel is about. You haven't missed too much. Uh, the first two presentations investigate editorial practices and use during the early Republic while the latter pair of presentations consider the ways that digitization positively impacts a project's work processes, functionality, and productivity. In short, we'll be investigating how the medium affects the message, how the historical context of these two disparate eras, particularly their publishing infrastructures, impact the edit editorial decisions made by Selkirk and Sparks, and by Milliken and Minty. So without further ado, we'll start with our first presentation delivered by Rob Haberman. Rob K. Haberman is the editor of the Revolutionary War Memoir of James Selkirk and an adjunct assistant professor in the history department at Fordham University. He formerly served as an associate editor for the John Jay Papers at Columbia University. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. <coughs> Thank you, Katie. Thank you to my fellow panelists. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my talk today, the Revo Revolutionary War Memorialist as editor, the memoir of James Selkirk. Today, I will discuss the Revolutionary War memoir history produced by James Selkirk. This manuscript work constitutes an early and rare example of a hybrid genre, a genre that I am terming a memoir history. This genre combines the subjectivity, authenticity, experience, and insight of a personal memoir with the accuracy, impartiality, synthesis, and analysis of a historical account. The centerpiece of this document records Selkirk's extensive service as a quartermaster sergeant in the Continental Army, while the remaining sections provide a broad chronological and thematic narrative of revolutionary events. Selkirk wrote the memoir history at an advanced age when he was no longer able to continue his trade as a tailor. Seeking to share his wartime experience with a wider audience, Selkirk attempted, albeit unsuccessfully, to publish his work via subscription. The manuscript that Selkirk prepared for publication, however, differed considerably from the books and pamphlets authored by other memoirists who had also served in the Revolutionary War. While their writings contained mostly firsthand accounts of their military service, Selkirk expanded the content and scope of his memoir by inserting several passages from a prominent published history of the American Revolution. Today's talk examines Selkirk's role as editor and the corresponding choices he made in composing this hybrid memoir history. My talk also considers what the work itself signifies within the corpus of lifetime writings produced by American veterans of the Revolutionary War. I pay, I pay close attention to why Selkirk plagiarized so extensively and how these creative and distinctive acts of textual borrowing contributed to the emergence of a new literary genre in the early Republic a genre that allowed Selkirk, a non-elite author from the lower middling classes, to assert his authority as a narrator of revolutionary history. Let's see if this works. Oh, I'm trying to commit in. <laughs> he needs a cape. <laughs> Don't need the picture. <laughs> we do. We do. Okay. okay, this is good. <laughs> I can just, can I just, 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 good, 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 thank you. All right. Perfect, sorry about that everyone. So born in Scotland in November, 1757, James Selkirk migrated to New York in 1774. 
In early 1776, he joined John Nicholson's regiment at Ticonderoga. In December of that year, Selkirk enlisted in the battalion referred to as the 1st Canadian Regiment that was raised and led by James Livingston. When this unit disbanded in late 1780, Selkirk joined the 2nd New York Regiment commanded by Philip Van Cortland. In his six and a half years of active service, Selkirk participated in numerous campaigns, including the engagements at Saratoga, Newport, Springfield, and Yorktown, and he also survived the harsh winter encampment at Morristown. In his memoir, Selkirk faithfully recorded the drudgery, deprivation, and dangers that he and his fellow soldiers faced. Like the better known Revolutionary War memoir, written by Joseph Plum Martin, Selkirk's account is filled with anecdotes centered on the themes of severe military discipline, ill health and infectious disease, unceasing hunger, fatiguing labor, and exposure to inclement weather. After receiving his uh, discharge at War's End in June 1783, Selkirk moved to Bethlehem, New York. In this town, he made a modest living as a tailor, married Elizabeth Henry in January 1786, and together they raised a family of 10 children. Selkirk died at the age of 63 in December 1820. His patriotic activity, however, was not forgotten by local citizenry. In the late 19th century, the hamlet of Selkirk was created in the southeastern section of Bethlehem Township. And in more recent years, his descendants erected a state historical marker commemorating his service during the Revolutionary War. And just to show you on the map on the left, on top we have Albany. Uh, below it, you can see prominently Bethlehem. And then the hamlet of Selkirk is located just below where it says Cedar Hill. Okay, and the blue ribbon, uh, as we know, is the Hudson River. Okay. So the memoir history that Selkirk created is largely unknown as it has remained within the fa uh, Selkirk family for generations. And uh, members of the Selkirk family contacted me and have contracted me to produce a scholarly edition of the memoir. And this is to coincide with the 250th anniversary uh, of the Declaration of Independence. So the memoir is an unbound and uncovered manuscript measuring six and one quarter inches in width and seven and three quarter inches in height and three quarters of an inch in depth. It contains 242 pages, 10 of which are blank. The opening section of the work contains paratext paratextual materials, which are shown here, proving that Selkirk intended publication in print. Indeed, the prospectus was also printed as a separate sheet, which we see here. Images for three copies of these printed proposals still exist, and they contain the names and residences of 21 subscribers. In terms of textual content, Selkirk allocated 42 pages covering his personal experience as a soldier in the Continental Army. At the same time, he incorporated 186 pages of material from David Ramsey's two volume History of the American Revolution. Um, and this uh, material from Ramsey amounts to slightly over 80% of the body text. So for the rest of my presentation, I will address four related queries concerning Selkirk's textual bothering. First, why did Selkirk take information specifically from Ramsey's history instead of other published sources? Second, what revolutionary topics and events did Selkirk select for inclusion from Ramsey's book? And how did he incorporate the plagiarized material with his personal account? Third, how did members of the early book trade understand and view plagiarism? And to what extent was it an accepted practice in the early Republic? And finally, is it more accurate to see Selkirk not just as a plagiarist per se, 
But as an editor with personal economic and political reasons for trying to publish a work that was both a memoir and a history. Of course, in many ways, it is unsurprising that Selkirk relied heavily on Ramsey's history, since it provided a comprehensive narrative and analysis of the origins, developments, and outcomes of the American Revolution. First printed by Robert Aiken of Philadelphia in 1789, Ramsey's book was one of the earliest histories written on the subject, and it proved highly popular on both sides of the Atlantic, gracing the shelves of numerous libraries and receiving favorable reviews. Moreover, the history underwent seven more editions during Selkirk's lifetime, being printed twice more in the United States, three times in London, and twice in Dublin. Selkirk's printed proposal for his work entitled A New and Complete History of the American Revolution in Three, pa in three Parts points again to his hefty yet unacknowledged literary debt to Ramsey's History of the American Revolution. For starters, the titles are similar. And I wanna point out, you can see the three parts here uh, on the top part of the proposal. The first part covers Selkirk's own account, the second and third parts, which run from the origins of the conflict to the years of the war itself, to the revolutionary settlement, they're covered in parts two and three. Selkirk even used 16 of the same chapter headings that had appeared in Ramsey's history. And here we see an example of this overlap in the sections labeled the campaign of 1777 in the Middle States. Now to clarify, I wanna point out that even though Selkirk borrowed liberally from Ramsey, he did not simply copy entire chapters. Rather, he edited in a judicious manner, inserting what he deemed to be the most relevant ideas and interesting episodes, and also paraphrasing when applicable. Another example of Selkirk's careful editing is illustrated in this slide discussing the Battle of Yorktown. In his, set, in his service with the 2nd New York Regiment, Selkirk had participated in the Yorktown campaign and wrote about his experiences during the siege and accompanying assaults on British redoubts. He recognized, however, that his personal account provided only a limited perspective. So he included Ramsey's description of the battle for the purpose of providing greater context and depth to his own recollections. And on the left part of the slide, we have a transcribed portion from Selkirk's manuscript, which discusses the Battle of Yorktown. The plain text is Selkirk's story, and the highlighted text is Ramsey's description. And on the right and center, we see pages 559 and 560 of Ramsey's history, which served as a source material for the highlighted text in Selkirk's work. Selkirk's editorial skills are much in evidence here. He has interwoven his text with Ramsey's in a manner that produces a singular, flowing, and seeming, seamless narrative of the assault and occupation of British fortified positions. Since Selkirk failed to publish his manuscript, we do not know how contemporaries viewed his extensive plagiarism. We do know, however, that noted historians of the American Revolution, including David Ramsey, Mercy Otis Warren, William Gordon, and John Marshall, and we see title pages from their works here, that these historians frequently borrowed from other authors and one another. These writers also relied heavily on the London-based annual register. Now the register was a yearly journal that circulated widely in America and offered a narrative summary of events and developments affecting the British empire. Whereas today we largely equate acts of plagiarism with intellectual dishonesty or lack scholarship, writers in the early Republic perceived that the mark of an accomplished historical work was not based on displays of original thought and individual creativity. 
Rather, it stemmed from the consummate skill required to imitate and emulate noted authorial predecessors by judiciously incorporating, refining, and commenting on their text. Eileen K. Chang has referred to these collective acts of plagiarism as an editorial conception of authorship. Even as such practices increasingly came under fire by the 1820s from critics who emphasized individual genius or advocated for more rigorous use of quotation marks and citations, published authors like Ramsey and would-be published authors like Selkirk adhered to this practice of editorial authorship. I will conclude my paper with a discussion of how Selkirk did not produce a mere memoir, but instead transformed his personal account into a hybrid memoir history. Selkirk stated in the preface that his friends encouraged him to carry out this writing project and that it stemmed from his own desire to educate the American public and particularly its young men about the sacrifices and sufferings of those who would serve the Patriot cause. The current generation, Selkirk warned, must not take for granted the national independence and personal freedoms that they celebrated every 4th of July. Mm. Yet other compelling reasons further explain why Selkirk produced a memoir history and sought to have it published. One key reason involved Selkirk's successful application for a lifetime pension granted by the federal government through the passage of the Revolutionary War Pension Act of 1818. Filling out the application undoubtedly jogged memories of his wartime service and prompted Selkirk to provide additional proof that he was a deserving applicant. Only those veterans who had served a minimum of nine months in the Continental Army and who lived in a state of reduced circumstances and in need of financial assistance were eligible for the program. Selkirk met these requirements and applied for the pension on March 31st, 1818. On that date, he appeared in person at his local courthouse and swore an oath attesting to his military service and current status. As a former quartermaster sergeant, he was entitled to the $8 per month allotment due to enlisted personnel, and he received this amount for his remaining two years. And I'd like to add that following his death, his wife um, also successfully applied for the pension in 1838. Now, the printed proposal for his work is undated, and Selkirk did not specify when he either wrote or revised his memoir or sought to have it published. Beyond stating in the preface that he had begun writing it in at least 20 years uh, after the conflict ended. However, evidence in the form of Selkirk's pension application combined with the typographical features located in the printed proposal suggest that he sought publication between 1818 and 1820. And also let me add to this that Selkirk mentions in the preface that he is a uh, long retired and a uh, man of modest circumstances who has to provide for his household. Now, as we see from the prospectus, Selkirk intended his finished work to appear as a duodecimo bound volume of 400 pages, moderately priced at $1. Surviving subscription sheets show that Selkirk's work did not come close to reaching a national audience. In fact, he enrolled only 21 prospective subscribers, three from Albany, eight from Bethlehem, and 10 from nearby Queemans. These local patrons were undoubtedly friends and possibly even veterans who had served alongside Selkirk. Although the work went unpublished, Selkirk's memoir history should nonetheless be recognized as a literary conduit that amplified, amplified his voice and granted him entry into a contentious national conversation over the meaning of Revolutionary War service, the current status of veterans, and the gratitude and recognition that was due them from the government and the population at large. 
whereas Selkirk might not have shared the same social rank, wealth, or prominence of an author like David Ramsey. His innovative editing and accompanying creation of the memoir history distinguishes him as a founding historian and asserts his authority as a narrator of the revolutionary era. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Rob. That was very interesting. And I look forward to digging into that text more during the Q&A. Up next, we have Catherine Garrett, who is a research editor with the Washington Papers, uh, a former research editor with the Washington Papers and Center for Digital Editing at the University of Virginia, and now with Virginia Humanities. Uh, she was on the team of editors for the Papers of Martha Washington and is currently editing a digital edition of the Papers of Bushrod Washington. Thank you, Catherine, for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, I was good. now having heard Rob's paper, I'll start mine with speaking of plagiarism and we are talking about John Marshall. <laughs> um, so this is a correct history of the country, how Bushrod Washington and John Marshall shaped Jared Sparks, the writings of George Washington. Um, in the early 1850s, Lord Mann, a British historian, wrote a scathing review of Jared Sparks 12 volume edition of George Washington's papers published about a decade earlier. Mann pointed out that, quote, Mr. Sparks has printed no part of the correspondence precisely as Washington wrote it, but has greatly altered and as he thinks, corrected and embellished it, unquote. One example is a letter where Washington referred to a British general as old putt, which Sparks silently corrected to General Putnam. Uh, in another, Washington referred to a small amount of money as but a flea bite, which Sparks changed to, quote, totally inadequate to our demands. <laughs> <laughs> More significantly, Sparks edited out an entire sentence where Washington wrote that some loyalists had, quote, committed what it would have been happy for mankind if more of them had done long ago, the act of suicide. Uh, Sparks argued that he only made changes for purposes of clarity, altering, quote, obvious slips of pen, occasional inaccuracies of expression, and manifest faults of grammar. <laughs> Mann did not find this convincing and maintained his position that Sparks' work was, quote, an act of literary forgery. <laughs> uh, I have no intention of arguing that Sparks was an unbiased editor. <laughs> uh, his own words make it clear that his edition was meant to be a tribute to Washington. He wrote, quote, my ambition was to make a perfect edition of his writings, one that should stand as a perpetual monument worthy of his fame and his country, unquote. It's just that Sparks definition of perfect was not always what Washington wrote. <laughs> um, what I would like to do is go into a bit of detail about Sparks partnership with Bushrod Washington and John Marshall and how their influence actually shaped some of Sparks editorial decisions. Uh, it's clear to me from their correspondence that both Washington and Marshall not only approved of Sparks filial piety, uh, but they demanded it. <laughs> And I wouldn't usually word, use a word like filial piety, but it fits Sparks perfectly. And when I saw it, I actually looked it up to make sure I was using it correctly in the <laughs> Oxford English Dictionary. And one of the examples they give is Jared Sparks. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so in his will, George Washington left all of his papers to his nephew, Bushrod Washington, including, quote, such of my private papers as are worth preserving, unquote. Almost immediately, this led to problems. Uh, in 1801, Alexander Hamilton wrote to uh, Bushrod Washington, requesting to have some of his letters sent to him for political reasons. Washington replied that, quote, he had felt considerable embarrassment in consequent of the application, unquote. He explained that while he would like to help Hamilton, if he did so, he would be obliged to help everyone, uh, regardless of party. Uh, when it came to Washington's letters, he wrote that both sides, quote, may resort to the same quiver for arms to fight with, unquote. His main concern was that, quote, the papers might be used in a way very different from that which I am persuaded was intended by the person who confided them to my care, unquote. So while Washington was not at this point a practicing documentary editor, he was making editorial decisions. Just as his uncle had asked him to decide which papers would be worth preserving, Washington felt that he had the obligation to do with the papers what he thought his uncle would desire. John Marshall and Bushrod Washington began working together on a biography of Washington in the fall of the year 1800, making heavy use of Washington's papers. 
While Marshall was responsible for writing the work, Bushrod shipped the papers, helped with editorial decisions, and corresponded with the publisher Caleb P. Wayne. Much of Marshall and Washington's correspondence involving this volume will sound familiar to a modern documentary editor. Uh, Washington wrote to his impatient publisher, quote, were the subscribers still more clamorous than they are, the work could not go on faster. If they had any conception of the labor and time required to examine many trunks of papers, they might perhaps be more considerate, though of this I should doubt. Unquote. Uh, Wayne, from the publisher's perspective, wrote that Mr. Marshall will ruin me by making the volume so large. <laughs> They also faced issues alien to a modern editor of 18th century documents. Marshall was publishing papers of people who were still alive. Uh, one of the more dramatic cases came when he planned to publish some letters between Benjamin Rush, Patrick Henry, and George Washington from the winter at Valley Forge. Rush had written anonymously to Henry on 12th January, 1777 with strong criticisms of the American forces. Quote, her army, what is it, he wrote. Quote, a major general belonging to it called a few days ago in my hearing, called it a few days ago in my hearing, a mob. He concluded, quote, the Northern Army has shown us what Americans are capable of doing with a general at their head. Quote, Henry forwarded the letter to Washington, who did some sleuthing to, to, uh, to George Washington, who did some sleuthing to find the author. When he discovered it was Rush, he wrote to Patrick Henry, the anonymous letter with which you were pleased to favor me was written by Dr. Rush, so far as I can judge by the similitude of hands. This man has been elaborate and studied in his professions of regard for me and long since his letter to you. In 1804, Rush understood that his words and Washington's condemnation of him would be disastrous to his reputation if they were published. He wrote to Bushad Washington that quote, it is foreign to my wishes to hint at present at the state of the public mind towards General Washington to toward, towards the close of the year 1777, and which events subsequent to that year altered in his favor." Unquote. He framed his concern as a simple error on Washington's part. Rush pointed out that he had resigned from his post two weeks after writing that letter and had had no interaction with Washington after that date. So George Washington must have been confused when he implied that Rush had been elaborate and studied in his interactions with him. By framing this as a small error on Washington's part, he hoped to encourage the editors to quote, erase the passage objected to in General Washington's letter to Governor Henry, as well as the inference drawn from it, unquote. From an editorial and historical standpoint, this is a complicated issue. Rush's letter to Patrick Henry is, as he states, uh, an example of how some people were feeling about Washington's leadership at that historical moment. And Washington's response to it is historically significant as well. His feelings about Rush were permanently changed by that letter. Uh, his reaction, even his misinterpretation of the date, reveals something about his sensitivity to criticism. This isn't simply a correction of grammar. It's an editorial removal of a historic moment. Following today's standards, we would of course keep that paragraph in and even consider its removal to be irresponsible. But in 1804, things looked a little different. Uh, as Rush wrote in his increasingly desperate letters, uh, quote, in suppressing the letter or passages attended to, you will prevent a great deal of pain to a large family of children, some of whom are now reading with great pleasure the history of the general's life. Marshall and Washington chose to cut the lines from the letter. John Marshall's editorial philosophy was similar to Bushrod Washington's. He wanted to write a patriotic history, which would honor the legacy of George Washington. Uh, in fact, before removing the sentence that Rush objected to, he made him write back and uh, point out that he had been wrong in the winter of 1777 and George Washington was a good general. Uh, Marshall, of course, claimed impartiality. His friend and fellow Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story wrote that Marshall, quote, examines all the material before him with the sobriety and impartiality of judicial life, unquote. But Marshall was very much a Federalist, writing with a Federalist lens at a time when party resentments were electric. Thomas Jefferson was so anxious about Marshall's biography that he began collecting his own papers to publish in self-defense. Uh, in the end, whether or not you just considered Marshall's life of Washington to be partisan depended on your political party. Um, Democratic Republicans excoriated it. After finishing volume five, the volume which contained the most political editorializing on Marshall's part, he wrote, I have reason to fear that the imprudent task I have just executed will draw upon me a degree of odium and calumny which I might otherwise have escaped. Uh, Marshall and Washington continued to tweak the life of George Washington in the years after its publication. 
Uh, they even began to work on a new project, editing Washington's letters for publication, but progress was slow. In 1824, Bushrod Washington received a letter from up and coming scholar, Jared Sparks, who asked if Washington would be interested in working with him on a print publication of Washington's papers. Uh, Bushrod responded he was much too busy. Sparks mulled on the idea for nearly two years before trying again. Uh, in 1825, the year between Sparks' first question and his follow-up, Washington and Marshall became embroiled in yet another controversy regarding George Washington's papers. Ever since around 1808, rumors had spread that Alexander Hamilton had been the true author of George Washington's famous farewell address. Uh, Marshall wrote to Washington in June of 1825, having heard that a letter between George Washington and Hamilton had been found that heavily suggested, if not proved, that Hamilton was the author of the farewell address. Marshall's worry was that people may conclude that, quote, those supposed to be the most attached to the fame of General Washington, unquote, had concealed the letter, even though, as he wrote, quote, the fact undoubtedly is that we have never seen it. The fact was that Bushrod Washington had seen it. Um, he copied out the letter in 1819, and it didn't prove Hamilton's authorship, but that Hamilton had assisted in the writing and editing of the address. But it's still fair to say that Bushard Washington had concealed the letter. He added a memorandum to his copy, quote, never to use or authorize its being publicly used unless it should become necessary to rescue the general's character from the charge now slyly propagating, but which may be more publicly avowed that General Washington was not and that General Hamilton was the writer of that address, unquote. <laughs> Uh, many prominent Federalists were involved in the conversation around the farewell address, with Richard Peters avowing to John Jay in 1811, if I had it in his handwriting, that is Hamilton's, I would burn it. <laughs> Shortly after the farewell address controversy died down somewhat, Sparks again reached out to Washington with a lengthy and detailed plan for how he would publish George Washington's letters. He came across quite confidently. He promised, quote, to spare neither industry nor expense in endeavoring to execute it as far as my ability will allow in a manner creditable to the fame of Washington, to our literature and to our national history. Sparks was hardly put off when Washington told him that he and Marshall were already creating their own selected edition of Washington's papers. Sparks argued that he was the man to do it and that Bushrod would maintain control over the content. Quote, the day may of course come when all these papers will find their way to the public in some form or other, unquote. Is it not better that they should be published under your own eye with your inspection and guidance, unquote. Sparks stated that he was more than willing to take on the literary part of the project, quote, it being understood on your part that any paper may be withheld which you do not deem suitable for publication, unquote. Washington was not convinced, but Marshall was, and after meeting with Sparks during a session of the Supreme Court, they agreed to let him visit Mount Vernon in March of 1827 to begin work on the project. Bushrod Washington gave Sparks some advice, to which Sparks responded. And this is a very long quote, so I apologize, but I'm gonna read the whole thing out. <laughs> quote, in publishing the letters received by General Washington, I am fully aware of the delicacy you mention, and trust my judgment will guard me against any indiscretion which shall afford reasonable grounds for complaint. I believe it may be set down as a rule that in every case it will be safe to print, even with the names, whatever reflects credit on all persons concerned. But wherever the heat of party or local causes give an unfavorable tone to the writer's feelings and sentiments and lead him into harsh reflections on others, there will be room for deliberation and perhaps a motive for passing by letters in other respects highly interesting. So Washington and Marshall felt an obligation to publish only the papers which they thought George Washington would want them to publish, and they passed this obligation on to Jared Sparks. I don't think that Sparks necessarily objected to that filial piety, but it was something that was definitely encouraged by them as well. I think that it's an interesting conversation to talk about <clears throat> this level of bias in an edition, because so many of the current conversations in documentary editing have to do with bias, have to do with the editor and author's motivation in publishing these letters. And it raises, there's a lot of questions of whether it's even possible to publish a fully unbiased edition of someone's letters, even deciding whose letters to publish includes some level of editorial <coughs> decision-making. But when you look at a volume like Sparks, you can clearly tell something's wrong here. So would it be better if Sparks had been more open with his bias? Um, to what extent should the impact on living people be taken to an account in an editorial project? I just think even though it's an old editorial project, it raises questions that we can still mull on today. Um, so thank you very much.
Thank you, Catherine. Um, I remember at the Washington papers that we would have an image of Sparks up during Halloween as a bit of a boogeyman. Uh, so I appreciate you speaking a little bit more about that today. Next up, we have uh, Christopher F. Menti, um, who is an editor at the Center for Digital Editing at the University of Virginia. He is the author of Unfriendly to Liberty, Loyalist Networks, and the Coming of the American Revolution in New York City. Thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for my panelists, and thank you to the Program Committee for accepting our panel. Um, I'm going to talk today about Naval Documents of the American Revolution. This is a project that I imagine many of you are familiar with and have used over the years. So I'm going to talk about how the project came to be, what happened with the project, and what we're hoping to do with it now at the Center for Digital Editing. So the NDAR, as we call it, is one of the historic projects that was founded in the mid 20th century. It stands alongside projects like the papers of Thomas Jefferson, papers of Benjamin Franklin and the Adams papers, and it was published out the US Department of Defense <laughs> as part of its Naval History Division. That later evolved into Naval History and Heritage Command. Um, the first volume was published in 1964. The most recent volume, which is volume 13, was published in 2019. And the project has gone up to around August 1778. The intent of the project is to go to 1785. So there's a lot of material still to cover and a long way to go. Um, so far, the project has published more than 22,000 documents. And if you've used NDAR, you know the volumes are very large. They're very big, they're very heavy. They have more than a thousand pages. These are large volumes, they're sometimes difficult to use but the material in them is very significant and important. Um, many of the volumes included presidential forward, forwards, folks like JFK, Nixon, all the way to Obama. Now, all of these volumes are available online, part of the CDE website, and it's ndar-history.org. Now, I've spoken to people who work on naval history, and they didn't know that this existed. And it was kind of distressing to me thinking for people didn't know that NDAR existed. And it's something that we've been thinking about at the center is how to move forward with the project and how it can evolve. So where <laughs> the project started. The collection of NDAR was built. It wasn't a collection like the Adams papers at the Mass Historical, where people can go upstairs and get them. The first editor, William Bell Clark, built the collection. He was invited to become editor because he already had a lot of materials on hand and they expanded that. Now, Clark was neither a historian nor an editor. He wasn't formally trained. He was a newspaper man and a businessman, but he was very well versed in naval history and he became the first editor. Now, to kind of make up for Clark's weaknesses, they formed two, one committee on naval history and they had consultants on NDAR. So that you can see there, there are probably some very familiar names to you all, Julian Boyd, the Jefferson Papers, Walter Muir Whitehill, he worked at the Athenaeum, was heavily involved with the Franklin Papers, the Adams Papers, and the Jefferson Papers. And then consultants, Francis Berkeley, he was at UVA and helped start the papers of George Washington, was Lyman Butterfield from the Adams Papers and the Jefferson Papers. Marion Brewington was a maritime historian at Peabody Essex up in Salem, Massachusetts, and Leonard Labery from the Franklin Papers. So these people were all involved in starting the project, setting its standards, setting the editorial policy, and moving it forward and getting it off the ground. The editorial policy, this, uh, I'll highlight the top lines and the bottom lines. The first line is probably one of my favorite lines in the editorial policy, that the policy reveals itself in the text. <laughs> <laughs> the editorial policy reveals itself in the text, although a few points might be noted. So that's saying to your user, to your reader, off you go, <laughs> and you'll, you'll find out. <laughs> and then at the bottom line, we anticipate at least 15 volumes. They've already published 13 and they're up to August 1778. So that's a traditional story. People, they think that they can do more than they can. <laughs> so volume 13 was published in 2019. This is 1964. And they're saying 15 volumes. And then the last sentences I like as well. Mr. Clark has manuscripts for three and six well in hand so he's off to the races and he's doing very well um when the project published its first volumes as many of these projects did they were reviewed in scholarly journals now 
one historian called George Bellius reviewed almost all of the first volumes. The first uh, review he did was part, published in the Journal of Southern History, and he took it apart. He said the editorial policy was sloppy. It, they made silly decisions from their copy text. And then he said pretty much the same thing for volume two, volume three, volume four, <laughs> and volume five. When the center first started considering taking this project on, one of the first things I did was download all of the reviews. And I saved them all into a Google Drive. And then I put them into three buckets. One is the positive bucket. This is the best thing that's ever been published. And there were some of them. One is the neutral bucket, like mm -hmm. it's fine. And it complements Jefferson papers, Adams papers, and so on, and the negative bucket. And there were a large number of reviews in each. Some people just said that this was brilliant. They didn't really engage with the materials, the editorial policy. They just said that the documents themselves were significant and that was all that mattered. <laughs> Billius took a different stance and in volume five or volume five, he said the project itself is of the utmost historical significance. He recognized how important the project was, but he started the review. These are the first lines in the review in the American Historical Review. And he said, I have been critical of the Navy's documentary history of the revolution in the past. If I continue to be so, it is not out of sheer perversity. So he recognizes that he's saying the same things, but nothing has happened. For the same volume, volume five, another review published in the New England Quarterly by Hiller Zobel said the volume was delightful. <laughs> And the series was pleasurable. So you can see that people were have the differing opinions of the volume. And you can see here on, on the screen, volume two, the editorial method is uncomplicated, and they complicated it a little bit in, with volume 10 and volume 13. And these were to bring the project in line with modern standards in documentary editing. These are some examples of the editorial policy that someone like Billius identified. So there were limited codes for source text. So they just did L for letter. What, what kind of letter is it? <laughs> is it an autograph letter? Is it sign? Is it a draft? And then they just used copy for all copies. What type of copy is it? Is it a letter book copy? Is it a file copy? Is it a press copy? They didn't have anything like that. In terms of the collection, they were missing some document variants. Now, I learned this in my work for the papers of George Washington. I would go looking for a document in Endar just to see if they had it. Because the Washington papers had it, I wanted to see if Endar had it. And quite often, it didn't. Now, one of the things that Endar did that Billius kept on identifying is that they were printing documents from Peter Force's American archives when the original was available. So Billius thought that was a big no-no. One of the unique things about Endar compared to other projects is its multidimensional perspectives on the American Revolution. And this is where it's really valuable, is that not only does it print American documents focusing on the American aspects, the naval history of the revolution, it prints British, it prints French, it prints Spanish and Dutch. This is a wide variety of documents from archives all over the world that can really make the project a one-stop shop for the naval history of the revolution. If it would be comparable to say the papers of George Washington also printing the papers of Sir Henry Clinton. One of the other things that they do is the chronicle, chronological arrangement of the volume. You'll see there they have an American theater and they have a European theater. Uh, what I really liked in this is that they didn't alter the spelling, which is something I would have done. I would have had a US spelling and then a British <laughs> spelling just to, just, just to cover it. <laughs> um, but this, but the way that the, the volumes have been arranged, the materials that are included in the volumes make the project unique compared to other editions. Now, the, I mentioned earlier that the Endar collection was created. It's a microfilm-based collection. And in going to look at this project down at the Washington Navy Yard, Jennifer Sturzer and I visited a couple of times, and I went down subsequently to inventory the collection. I wanted to know how many microfilm reels are there. There are over a thousand. And if we take on this project, what reels do we need? What reels are available online? What do we need to take with us? So I got the Amtrak down, the Acela, made my way down. It was just going to be a one day trip and I was going to image the microfilm reels. And I thought, this will be fine. It's not that many reels. I can get a lot of them in my iPhone. And I started just taking sort of maybe one fifth of these ginormous sliding cabinets, sliding drawers, were all, they were all held. 
And I quickly had to abandon that and stand on a chair. And this is me standing on a chair, sort of holding my phone up, taking pictures of the collection. And they have stuff that we definitely do not need. Like they have the papers of George Washington from the Library of Congress. We don't need that. It's available online. They also have the Hamilton papers available online. They have newspapers. We probably don't need all of them. They're available online at AHN. But they also have documents from private collections in Italy, private collections in France, private collections in the UK. Probably need things like that. Now, with over thousand microfilm reels, you can imagine the expense in creating something like this. So we're having to be quite careful in what we take and what we say we don't need to take. In terms of their control file, this is probably a familiar image to many <laughs> of you. It's paper-based. They have slips like this, it's very detailed. They have lots of things that you can fill in. What was striking to Jennifer and I is that it's incomplete. They haven't inventoried the entire collection. So it doesn't go up to 1785 when the Continental Navy was disbanded and the project was meant to finish. It, it goes up sort of haphazard beyond the, pro the volumes that have been published. So the sense that we got is that they added to it as they went and they continue to add these slips. Now, the benefit of reading forward isn't really possible with this type of control file. This is something that I was told when I started as an editor is reading forward will always be helpful. You can't really do that here. Um, we also learned that there was at one time a Microsoft Access database. I thought I wanted to get a hold of this. The first database that I built when I was a grad student was a Microsoft Access database. I worked at the papers of Francis Bernard. They used the Microsoft Access database. And now they couldn't find it. And th this, th they took probably about three weeks to a month to get a definitive answer. And I thought wrongly, I assumed wrongly, that because this was a government project, they would have multiple copies of it saved digitally. They, it uh -huh. seemed that they didn't. So this is what we're working with. Thousands of pieces of paper like this that have all of this information, but not for all of the documents. In particular, the documents that we would have to edit moving forward. Hmm. So project productivity. You'll see there the first volume was published in 1964, and then the most recent in 2019. And for the first few volumes, they move at a good clip. They're published every couple of years, every one year, which is pretty impressive. And then once you hit the 70s, things start to slow down a little bit in the 80s. So it was four, six, 10, nine. The length of the volumes gets shorter as well. There are fewer documents. So volume 12 is over a thousand documents. It's 864 pages of documents. That is the shortest volume. They estimated in 2013 that it would take 27 letterpress volumes to complete it. And they retailed it for $99. So these are expensive. These are expensive volumes. They're also ginormous. Now, the reason that publication slowed wasn't because the editors were lazy or anything like that, is that the editors at Naval History and Heritage Command got put on other projects. And NDAR kind of fell by the wayside a little bit. They started focusing more on the War of 1812. And as the last editors retired, the replacements were not put on NDAR. So the people at Naval History and Heritage Command contacted us at the center about the possibility of taking on the project full time. So that would be editorial control and fiscal control of the project. Now, one of the things that I saw was quite striking, this is the government printing office, which was their publisher on volume 12. And in public talks on volume 12, former editors, they started their talk with this. And they would highlight that it's for a narrow group yeah. and they would, read, they would read it like this. And then the interest may exist and it may be interested. Yeah. And this relates to sort of public perceptions toward not just Endor, but documentary editing in general, that it's put out for a narrow audience. Now we know that not to be true, but people who don't know that we have a digital edition of Endar available online, people who don't know that the papers of someone have not been published, it relates to that. There's a narrow focus, people don't know it exists and the value is not fully appreciated or understood. Now, I've mentioned this already, but the history of sort of NDAR and the CDE. So all of the documents are available online and I'm gonna show you some examples of how you can browse the current NDAR digital edition. And then I'm gonna talk about how we might move forward with it. PDFs are also available online. 
on Naval History and Heritage Command, and that, that's not really a digital edition, it's just a PDF. Um, all of them are available, they're very large, um, large files. Um, when the digital edition was created, some errors are, were imported in and they haven't been remedied because full-time or even part-time work has not really continued on the project. It's kind of hard to navigate as well. You can keyword search, you can search by theater or date, but it's not always easy to find the documents that you're looking for. And I've experienced this. I think I can work my way through a digital edition. I find NDAR quite hard to use. So here is an example of the digital edition as it is. Now it's built in Drupal, Drupal 7, and, and you can see 23,000 documents, and then you can filter them by volume, by theater. You can also filter by recipient of it, if it's correspondence or the sender. Um, this is what it looks like at the moment. And then if we move forward, this is another the way that I was just describing how you can filter. So you can look for Samuel Graves' and stuff, Continental Congress, how many documents if you just want to study them. So if you're looking for a specific person and you're able to identify that person or you're looking for a specific thing, it's easy to get to. If you're just trying to browse, this is a bit of a theme with some digital editions, it's quite hard to find your way through. This is what a document looks like in the digital edition, and you'll see that it essentially replicates the print volume as close as we can. And this is also a theme of <clears> digital <throat> editions is that they're often wedded to print-based materials. And when you hear the phrase like born digital, that kind of plays into that. For many projects now, digital is the only option. And one typographer I spoke to a while ago told me that in the early 2000s, he charged $14 per page to typeset. And if you're publishing a 1,000 page volume, that gets expensive. And that doesn't include paper, that doesn't include ink or the binding. And press, a uh, UVA press reported about 10 years ago that it cost nearly $50,000 to publish a documentary edition. It's expensive. So why do we, why keep the project going? How to keep it going? So the Naval Historical Foundation, which is just across the road at Washington Navy Yard, they got in touch with us to visit the project and to see if we would be able to take it on. We have multiple site visits in 2022 to kind of survey the materials that were there, what we might be able to do with them. They kept on trying to, you know, UVA can take it, UVA can take it. And there was concern about like the weight on the floor would not be able to accommodate all of the chests of drawers. <laughs> and one thing that I was stunned by was the sheer amount of paper that was there. It was like a project that had been frozen in time. They printed out lots of newspapers, which are all available online and shoved them all on the shelves. And this just reflects that the editors who are working on it have been shifting on to other things. So as the Center for Digital Editing and taking on this project, it will be a digital edition. There will be no letterpress. So it's going to be a digital edition moving forward. Now that, has, that impacts our editorial decisions in terms of policy. How are we going to do that? Every aspect of our editorial policy will be affected from selection to publication options. Now, when I speak to editors about the importance of NDAR, they've said, well, yeah, it was great. But when, before, when we were behind them, they were ahead of us in terms of the Revolutionary War timeline. We used to always use NDAR, but then we got ahead of them. So you can see that in the scholarship as well on the naval history of the revolution is that they'll use NDAR up until 1778 and then stop and then off they go. But there's still important things to cover. If you think about the Yorktown campaign, there's the Battle of the Chesapeake, Battle of the Capes. This still needs to be covered in the Battle of the Saints. Now, this is a ginormous project. We're August 1778. You have to think about the fiscal and editorial realities of documentary editing. NHPRC has a 10-year cap on projects. Could we finish this project in 10 years? The traditional sort of couple of NHPRC and NEH, is that going to be enough to pay for editorial work on this? These are things that we are, we are considering. Thanks. So at the center, we've done a number of digital editions like the papers of Julian Bond, Mosaic NC, North Carolina. And one of the things that we're thinking about with this project is engaging more fully with digital humanities and scholarly publications and communications. So back in the 1950s and 60s, when documentary editions were founded, they really engaged with scholarly communications. This is a new form of scholarly communication that we have to consider. What are we going to do with NDAR moving forward? What's important to NDAR at the center? We want it to be accessible. We want it to be sustainable. 
outreach. We want people to know that the project exists and we want to do this in new and engaging ways. So the images that are on the screen now, these are all AI generated. And this is something that we're playing around with at the center. And all I did was type in naval documents of the American Revolution and it created these. And I, th I think they're pretty cool. And <laughs> we're engaging with AI at the center because there are thousands of people who are mentioned in documentary editions. You don't know what they look like. To make a project more engaging, you can use AI to give an image of what they might have looked like. And as long as you don't say this person was this image, I think it makes the projects more engaging and more interesting. What to cover? How are we going to tackle this? Are we just going to focus on battles, people, places, all? One thing is obvious is that we can't keep going the way that the project had been going. It can't be as comprehensive as it was in the past. We want to explore Black and Indigenous sailors, Black and Indigenous sailors ID and explore their lives in addition to the lives of people like John Paul Jones and de Graaf. How are we going to look at them? Edit documents, traditional edited documents. We could do a GIS story maps, which is something else that we're using at the center. Digital exhibitions, digital images of the documents. This relates to another issue that we have is that it's a microfilm collection. Are we going to scan all of the images and put microfilm Im images available online? Now, in giving this talk at the ADE, I thought it was an ideal venue because it's a room full of editors. And I really want to say, what would you do? How would you handle a project like mm -hmm. this? And then you're like this. This is, this is George <laughs> Washington in full naval gear. Looking <laughs> check really yeah. so what would you do? How would you tackle a project like this? Why is naval documents of the American Revolution important to you? What would you do with it? Thank you. I'll set up your slide, Neil. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, I know you're very eager to receive feedback on the types of resources to include on the Indar site, so I hope we get some uh, questions and suggestions during the Q&A. Up next, we have Neil Milliken from the Massachusetts Historical Society. Neil Milliken is the series editor for digital editions with the Adams Papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society. She's currently editing the John Quincy Adams Digital Diary, part of the Mellon sponsored primary source cooperative at the MHS. Thanks, Neil. Thank you, good afternoon. So I'm the opposite of Chris. I'm gonna be talking about the end of a project, not how to how to keep it going or how to progress it. During my presentation, I'd like to recap the work that has been ongoing since 2016 to publish the full corpus of John Quincy Adams' 15,000 plus page diary as a digital edition. I want to cover how we tackled this project, some of the decisions we made, and the lessons we learned while undertaking the first born digital project of the Adams Papers. Uh, first, a little bit of background. And I realize I have talked about John Quincy Adams at ADE multiple times, but I promise this will be the last year. If I talk about him again, it's not going to be the diary. Since its inception in June 2016, the goal of the John Quincy Adams Digital Diary has been to make the full corpus freely available online to allow its rich content to be as accessible as possible to scholars, students, and teachers. With this project being born digital and not behind a paywall, we had a chance to reach a large audience at initial publication, probably larger than our letterpress volumes when they first come out in print, later rolled out on Rotunda, and then on the Adams Papers Digital Edition. The John Quincy Adams Digital Diary has been a three-phase project. If you followed along online, you might have seen this. The full entries were analyzed first. Next work was completed on the rubbish and line of day volumes. And the final phase we're working on now is incorporating the two previously published letterpress volumes, the entries from 1779 to 1788, into the digital diary. All work on transcription and analysis is complete, and the proofreading and encoding work will finish in 2023. All right, so contextualization equals our version of annotation and indexing. As you may know, within the Adams Papers, work has been divided among three series. Series one are the diaries, series two, the family correspondence, and series three, the public papers of the Adams statesman. 
the directives, the Adams Papers internal document that explains and lays out all aspects of our editorial work, describes work on the diaries in the following manner. And this is also a long quote. Annotate the diaries as sparingly as possible. This may temporarily deprive the readers of some gems we would like to furnish them, but it will get the text, which are what matter most, into their hands faster. It will also save us time, effort, and perhaps some embarrassment since the successive documents, subseries, and series will annotate and even correct each other, bringing to light as we gnaw our way through the material information that we could only find with difficulty, if at all, by setting out to look for it. The important thing is then to move rapidly through the diaries so that the hoard of information they contain will be placed at our disposal as soon as possible for annotating the other series and will aid us at the same time in selecting documents for inclusion in those series. With that information in mind, while the most important function of the digital diary is to provide an accurate and authoritative text, we also strive to offer additional information to help readers better understand both the nature of the diary and the moment in which it was written. Editorial work has been informed, of course, by the practices of the documentary editing community. And the project serves that over overarching purpose, but within a digital environment. While the primary audience always remains the scholarly community, project editors collaborated with educators and the Massachusetts Historical Society's Education Department to specifically improve access for the K-12 community with this project. The digital diary centers around access for a broad community through narrative essays, encoded metadata for people in historical topics. Our chronological essays provide synopses of the national and world events that informed John Quincy Adams' personal experiences. And by the end of the project, there will be 12 of these essays. They will appear in both long and short format for very, with varying points of access. And that's gonna be um, one of the uh, features that'll be part of the new primary source cooperatives website. So if you go to the chronology section now, it's not there, but it will be there by the end of the calendar year. The diary records the thousands of individuals with whom Adams interacted throughout his life. Each identified person named in the diary was assigned a unique identification tag and is part of the cooperative's names database. Individual records include names, birth and death dates, when they were first mentioned, and a brief biography where known. And with the nearly 12,000 full entries that are currently up, they're also reviewed and assigned topical headings. The subject analysis was based on approximately 150 historical themes related to American history to 1848 and aligned with K-12 history curricula standards. And I should add that these encoded individuals and topics will be searchable not only within the John Quincy Adams diary, but also across the four primary source cooperative partner editions by the end of the year. All right, not working chronologically. This decision was made partly because of how the project developed. We started as a pilot project, working on John Quincy Adams' first stint as Secretary of State under James Monroe. So we started with September 1817, going to March 1821. We rolled these transcriptions out online in September 2017, capturing the momentum of the 200th anniversary of his taking that cabinet position. We had a launch event at the MHS where we publicized our project. That event serendipitously led to our receiving private grant money from the Amelia Peabody Charitable Fund to continue editorial work on the diary. With the infusion of these funds, work started to progress more quickly. After the Secretary of State period, we moved on to the presidency. Then we went back and proofread and analyzed the diaries covering 1789 to 1817 before going back and tackling the congressional years 1830 to 1848. Our decision to move back in time after we completed the presidency had a lot to do with the fact that not all of the congressional diaries had been transcribed yet. And we didn't want to start working on proofreading until we had more transcriptions banked. As with other documentary editing projects, the work of this edition was stacked and relied on previous workflow tasks being finished before the next step could begin. We needed enough transcription completed for the proofreading to be done and I like to wait until a whole year's worth of diary entries had been proofread, if I could wait, before I converted the Microsoft Word files to XML via a combination of TEI Garage and an in-house script built by the MHS web developer, Bill Beck. 
and we saved the rubbish volumes and the line a day diary as the penultimate parts for the same reason. They hadn't been fully transcribed yet. The very earliest years of entries are the last piece of the diary on which we are currently working. In 1981, the Adams Papers published a two volume letterpress edition of his diary from 1779 to 1788. So we did have those transcriptions available to us. The issue is that these diaries would need to be recollated based on the updated standards that the Adams Papers adopted in 2008. And I also needed the assistance of Bill Beck and Andine LeBlanc at the MHS to help us figure out how to take these two humongous XML files and chunk them out into the months and the years that we were used to working with um, on the diary. Also, this was the first time we were going to be proofreading in Oxygen, not in Microsoft Word. So I needed to do enough collation and proofreading and cross-checking to create instructions for our staff and to be able to teach them how to do this work and troubleshoot when they had issues. Special thanks again to Andine and Tess Renault for letting me use the CSS file that they created for the primary source cooperative, which has allowed the proofreading to occur in the author view within Oxygen. And Gwen has done some of that for us and it's been fabulous. And she's really enjoyed working in that environment. And it's opened a whole new world for us of now we can do this proofreading work in Oxygen before we'd always done it in the Word environment. Would it have been better to work chronologically? Possibly. But working out of order did have some advantages as I see it. It meant that the staff could be working on multiple parts of the diary at the same time and we were not overlapping each other. It also meant that we took a look at JQA's relationships with people out of order. When we started with the Secretary of State years, John Quincy and Louisa Catherine Adams had already been married for 20 years. So when we went back and looked at their courtship and marriage, it was very interesting to us to see when and how she was mentioned or not in the diary. Another example, we first got to know their children, their sons as teenagers, then young adults. Then we went back to their births and adolescence. Then we finally saw them getting married and having families of their own. The same with John Quincy's relationships with folks like Andrew Jackson and Henry Clay. For us, Jackson first shows up while JQA is Secretary of State. He's defending Jackson's actions in Florida to Monroe's cabinet. We then covered the election of 1824. Then we got Jackson, John Quincy's take on Jackson while John Quincy was serving abroad during the War of 1812, hearing about what Jackson's doing. And the same with Clay. JQA's views of Clay during his Secretary of State period and presidency were our first encounter with him. Only after that did we get to see their beginning of their relationship when they both, both served in the Senate together. And then after that, we got to the get treaty negotiations and JQA's less than favorable views of his fellow negotiator. Working this way also showed us that we do not have to move chronologically through a future born digital project. As you probably know, 2025 will be the 200th anniversary of John Quincy's presidential inauguration. So it would make sense to start a Papers of John Quincy Adams project at that point and harness any momentum surrounding that anniversary to begin the project. And, oh, stay on the slide. All right, next I wanna talk about our subjects. This is one area where we had some fits and starts looking at our list of topics. So we went from a system where we were freely tagging any relevant Library of Congress subject heading and constantly adding new subjects to our list to a set of about 150 topics, a very defined set. When we started, Susan Martin, who was the senior processing archivist at the MHS, she helped us create a, a beginning list of subjects based on the Library of Congress subject headings. And our idea was that these subject headings are pretty ubiquitous. Once they're encoded, these would link out well from our XML files. The problem was that we did not yet grasp the importance of starting with a defined top list. We would read through a month of diary, we would add new subject headings, and every month we would find new headings we could possibly use. The list of headings got very big, very fast, and it was not easy to remember all the headings on the list as we analyzed new months. <laughs> Plus the nested nature of the Library of Congress subject headings, you probably know they can be very, very long. Um, it meant that they were very cumbersome to enter into the XML files, even if we were copying and pasting them from the Library of Congress website. It also meant that the subject analysis and encoding was slow going because, because we were not coming from a library background, these subject headings were not second nature to us. Pretty quickly, we decided we needed a defined list of terms to choose from. 
So it was a good thing that we had this reboot because at that point we could really start working with the MHS education department with educators, looking at curricula, looking at standards, coming up with our list of topics. In the end, we have around 150 topics and our web developer again, Bill Beck, I mentioned his name a lot because I say he's a magician because he can just do <laughs> things to make our lives easier. But he built this drop down menu because it's only 150 and that meant when our encoders were putting in the topics, they could just go to the drop down list, there was no um, having to key in materials so the chance of encoder error is minuscule. When we joined the primary source cooperative and I saw the topics that our partner projects were using. Deb and Pat and David, I realized that they had employed some subjects that I wish we had as well. So good job to you guys for coming up with your list. But with the size of the diary corpus, we just didn't have the luxury of going back and retroactively applying new topics to entries that had already been analyzed. We had to stick to our list. Gardening is an example. Um, when we were crafting our original list, I hadn't proofread or looked through all the presidential years yet. So I didn't realize just how much time he spent in the White House garden and later gardening at the family home in Peacefield. But the upside of a digital edition is that we could always add new topics like this in the future, possibly as part of a volunteer intern project. So the process of going from the Library of Congress subject headings to our own list only lasted a few months, but it did mean that some of the files had to be reanalyzed using the defined list of topics. All right, hand encoding. And this is where this was a whole new world to me. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to learn the TI and XML, but there were definitely some learning curves involved. The majority of the 15,000 plus diary pages were a typical format. They look a lot like this. Uh, in XML, this is easy enough to hand encode. There's usually a date line that has to be tagged. There's also a list of names. So that goes in a list tag and an item tag. And because we were going from Microsoft Word to XML, we put it through TEI Garage, the paragraph tag tags are already there. So most of the pages that look like this pretty quick, we could get the hand encoding done. But then we got to the rubbish volumes and we get a lot of pages like this. And um, when we put it through TI Garage, um, we still have a lot of work we've got to do on the other end. So the four rubbish volumes that he kept, not only do these volumes contain diary entries, but they also have notes and memoranda, list of visitors, notes on land to be surveyed, commentaries on Bible passages, population statistics, election returns, and of course his poetry. These required a lot of hand encoding. This took time, and one of our part-time staff, Molly Nebbiolo, became very adept at encoding these pages. For a while, every time we came across a new iteration of a diary text that needed to be encoded, particularly if there were brackets involved, Bill Beck would help us figure out what the encoding should look like. And then after a while, I started using our test server as a way to make sure the encoding was happening properly and going back and fixing whatever hand encoded need to be worked on if parts weren't displaying as we wanted them to. Other lessons that I will say I have learned. Uh, the use of volunteer transcribers. While Adams Paper's staff have been chipping away at transcribing the diary for years, when we started, there were still thousands of pages left to be transcribed. At one point, we did have some part-time transcribers on staff, but for the most part, we did rely heavily on volunteers. Managing the volunteers did take a bit of my time, but the results were worth it, especially in terms of the volunteers who stuck with us for years. Their transcription skills increased over time, and the good part about the diary was that they were moving forward chronologically, so they started with uh, relatively middle-aged John Quincy Adams still has a really nice handwriting. So by the time we got to the older, <laughs> really shaky John Quincy Adams, they just took it in stride because they were familiar enough with his hand. Uh, another lesson that we learned in terms of the personal names. When we started this project, none of us realized how many people John Quincy would mention in his diary. Now he did keep it for 68 years, but we know there were between 30 and 35,000 unique individuals mentioned. And this is one area where we really didn't have the funds or the main power to wrangle it as I would have liked. We knew at the outset things like how long it's going to take to proofread or how long it's going to take to do some of that other work because as probably with your projects you keep detailed stats every month. How long does something take so that Sarah can say all right well how much is that going to cost us. But the personal names were something new. It was really hard for us to gauge at the outset how long that type of work we're going to take. Some of the people, family, friends, political and diplomatic associates 
they show up again and again. But then on the other side, we have a lot of people who are one off who show up one time in the diary, they visit John Quincy, they write to him or he mentions them. Um, the database that Bill Beck constructed for the primary source cooperative contains the shell information on these individuals. And our hope is that is, if there is a future Papers of John Quincy Adams project, we can both utilize the information already in the names database and also increase the depth of these entries to model more closely an identification we would do in a uh, fuller annotation in a letterpress volume. The other issue was verification of the names entries. In a traditional letterpress volume, verification is a built-in step. But because there were so many names, verification is still something that's ongoing with the diary project. Right now, we have one of our part-time staff people who's still chipping away at name verification, and we have about 15% of the names verified, so we still have a ways to go on that. And then the last thing for me that I learned really was project management. Um, so I was the only full-time person on this project. Everyone else was part-time volunteers or interns. Um, the thing for me was always learning how to do the next step, especially with digital that I ne hadn't necessarily done before, knowing how to do it well enough so that I could create instructions and teach someone else how to do it and help them troubleshoot when they had a problem. Most long established projects probably have a document like the Adams Papers directives for the letterpress volumes. It explains how to do almost every aspect of editorial work. And the Adams Papers directives is almost 200 manuscript word pages. It's invaluable to use as we work. But because this was the first born digital edition, I had to start with a version of the digital directives from scratch. Right now it's about 50 pages. And while we were actively working, I was constantly adding to this document. Um, and for me personally, it took a while to get used to the amount of time it would take to oversee folks. If you're in a managerial position, you already know this, but I had um, fits and starts on figuring out how to chunk my time. It's much easier now, but it's always a juggling act, figuring out when you're going to stop and help other people and when you're just going to continue on with whatever you're doing, because you know it has to get done. So uh, in, in the final thing, I guess I'll pitch again, the primary source cooperative. Um, as you guys know, the John Quincy Adams Digital Diary has been a standalone website, but we are now part of the primary source cooperative at the MHS. And um, so we're gonna be uh, working with our three partner projects. And as the year, the year goes on, um, the website's gonna become more robust, more content's gonna be added to it. So definitely follow along. And I should say, pick up some swag outside at the table. We don't want to cart it back with us. So there's <laughs> bags, notebooks, pencils, et cetera. Please take some home with you. Yes. <laughs> so in terms of our final takeaway, we have worked out many of the issues that arose during the John Quincy Adams Digital Diary Project. For example, Adams Papers transcript transcription typically occurs in Word. And throughout work on the diary, I would convert these files into XML post proofreading. Now, however, we've started to use an XML template modified from the primary source cooperative template for transcription and proofreading work directly in Oxygen. Being the first born digital project was not always easy as there was not necessarily someone else who could answer questions for us. We made our de decisions and then we stuck with them. However, we are now in a really good place to start on our next born digital edition, build building on the processes implemented for the digital diary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about this potential Papers of John Quincy Adams project. Um, like most things, I think I got a little overexcited with the amount of time we had available for this panel. And uh, despite having a list of questions, I also see we have just a few minutes left. So let's open it up to the audience. Are there any questions here for our panelists today? Holly. You can always count on me to have a question, but I'm just, we have these four diverse papers and, and, um, and as I understand, we're looking at sort of modalities of editing and what we're trying to do with how we understand it. So first we have Sedgwick who's promoting himself and not exactly a documentary edition, but a really interesting I mean, I love what you had to say about him and how he is of the lower middling sort and how that voice attempts at least to get into the public venue. And, um, and then after that, we have Jared Sparks. 
Um, I was talking to Katie earlier and my husband, who if you don't know, is, is uh, John Stagg, who's editor of the Madison papers and walking bibliography and encyclopedia of all things early Republic and commented about Jared Sparks that he really created the medium of the uh, documentary edition. So there is Jared Sparks who is promoting, yeah, he's promoting himself because he's a writer, but he's promoting a, a, um, and, and, and creating a kind of hagiography through letters of George Washington. And then we have these two more technical 21st century uh, papers. So I think, you know, the first two explain to me how the goal, what the goals are of the authors and what they're really trying to accomplish. The second two, you are the authors in a way. And so what does this say about how you envision your material and what as, um, yes, of course, you're, you're, you're uh, without opinion and totally um, uh, um, dispassionate about your work. But in fact, going behind that, how would you say both your relationship to the tradition of documentary editing, going back certainly to Sparks, and to this, these new technologies of the 20th century that you elucidated so brilliantly, how does that, how, how do all these fit together, these four papers fit together? And how do you see the, this 21st century which, in which we are still at the beginning of electronic publishing and we go back to, um, to Sedgwick and Sparks who were really before mass market publishing. And so at the beginning of something, and I'll shut up. Can I summarize your question, Holly? Um, I, uh, when talking earlier, we were discussing how the um, publishing infrastructures um, and more broadly the historical context in which these earlier editions were published and now the um, digital publishing infrastructure in which um, these later editions were published, how that, how that affects uh, the decisions uh, these individuals and you are making today, um, how does that impact the editions? Okay, well, I can start. So I will say with um, the diary, even though you guys follow us, you, you may know that we have through 1848 online right now, um, but we're doing the full corpus, the rubbish diaries, the line of day and everything, because that was the mandate from the Adams family that um, you know the letterpress volumes of the correspondence could be selective, but if you're gonna do the diary, you need to do the, the full corpus. So uh, eventually there's gonna be multiple entries for any one date. Um, but I think in terms of, so, we're not, we're not selecting what we're gonna put up there, but we are selecting the accessibility is the way that I see it. So um, in terms of our topic, um, last week I was at Schaefer and we were doing a, a round table on John Quincy Adams and the Monroe Doctrine. And so I went back and looked at some of those entries from the fall of 1823. And so many of them mentioned the Holy Alliance and the researchers on my panel, they said, you know, if we're scholars, we read a diary entry, we know what we're looking for. I read the Holy Alliance. I know this is something to do with the formulation of a Monroe Doctrine. A student is not gonna know that. And maybe not even a college student is gonna know that. So, you know, our hope is that by encoding these with Monroe Doctrine, even though it's before December 2nd, 1823, that we're providing that next level of accessibility. Yes, they're transcribed and you can read them online and they're keyword searchable, but by doing this extra level that we're providing that much more access because um, I do think that with these um, new digital tools, we have hopefully a way to reach a larger audience. Scholars are always going to know how to get what they want and find it, and they're really adept at doing research. But how do we sort of use the technology available to us to try to reach even more people than we've met reached in the past? Can I go? Uh, look, with, with NDAR, when we took over the project, Naval History and Heritage Command gave us free reign with what we want to do about it, how we want to move forward with it. So we applied for an NEH grant, a planning grant, which is for $75,000 to basically work out what we're going to do with the project. So all digits crossed for that. Um, but some of the things with the project are not up for debate. Like 
tra tra any transcriptions that are included have to be accurate. Any annotation has to be accurate. Users need to be able to follow what we're going to do with it. The, but the biggest thing that is up for debate is selection. What documents are we going to print in this edition? NDAR has traditionally printed a huge range of documents, including newspapers. Do we really need to print newspapers? Probably not. They're available online. People can find them. Do we really need to print documents that are available in other editions, like papers of George Washington, papers of Alexander, Alexander Hamilton? Maybe the argument could be made, no, you don't, because they're available elsewhere. But if you're working on the Battle of the Chesapeake, you'd think that might appear in NDAR, and you wouldn't have to go to another resource. So selection is the one thing that we're going to have to really think about thoughtfully and carefully. And in trying to determine what type of documents we're actually going to be dealing with, because we have over a thousand microfilm reels, we need to get a handle on the materials. Because if you don't really know where to start, you can't really work at where you're going to go. And that's what we're trying, that's what we're hopefully going to be doing in our planning grant year. Fingers crossed, all digits crossed. In terms of printing his work, to me, notwithstanding what he wrote in the preface um, about uh, educating the young men of America, et cetera, it seems that this is very much a localized product in a sense that he mentions that he had taken up the work probably early in 1800s. Um, he uh, stopped uh, his writing and then he was encouraged by his friends to uh, complete the project. And then looking specifically at the subscription sheet, and, and again, there are three of these, uh, the subscribers that he was um, able to attain for the work are all local, uh, Queemans, Albany, and Bethlehem. And some of these individuals, I, there, there's obviously more work that I can be doing with this, but um, I might also add this is a part-time project for me with the teaching uh, responsibilities as well, but this is certainly something I think that needs to be examined more. For instance, those names that, I, that appear on that sheet, I have, I did a quick search on uh, the newspaper database, found six of them in a political notice for Clemens from 1820, where they're all uh, supporting Daniel Tompkins for governor. So, <laughs> That sells, that says something right there about who are these individuals in terms of at least. But is this part, do you think of local history in some ways, or is this in fact, do, would you put this into a, a broader stream of, of, of putting in documents into the public record? You see what I'm asking? Yes, well, this is very much a local history or family history in that we also have, for instance, uh, the Selkirk family Bible. We have uh, Selkirk's discharge papers. We have his will. But so they weren't pub they weren't trying to publish them. They were so not. We will continue trying to this it. conversation <laughs> over the coffee break. Um, earlier, someone said, go get everyone some food and coffee and start the session. And I said, that's not a line I'm going to cross. I'll interrupt people from questioning, but I'm not going to pull you from food and coffee. So um, that's my unpleasant task, unfortunately. Um, but we're done with this session. Please come back at 4.30, uh, where we'll have our final uh, final session of today. Thank you so much. Oh, please come back at 4.15. Thank you.